Hello again, this is Reimer Fofler from AKG Acoustics speaking to you from the head office in Vienna. Welcome back to the third chapter of my online training, Wireless Basics Part 1. Last time you heard about propagation of electromagnetic waves and their handicaps. This time we will focus on radio signal properties and also you will hear about some electronical circuitries that help to transmit and receive a radio signal with the reliability that is needed for today's professional requirements. So let's see what we have to deal with. Beside obstructions of wave propagation, there are also other handicaps to consider. That would be RF interference, electrical interference, and RF intermodulation. RF interference is mostly man-made electromagnetic energy that creates unwanted interactions between radio equipment. For example, two operators using wireless microphones at close or at the same frequencies will both face interference problems on their wireless channels. So you could say one man's desired signal is the other man's unwanted interference, and vice versa. In real life, of course, there will always be differences between the two radio channels in terms of emitted radio power and field strengths, so that the stronger signal would overrule the weaker one. And if you face uh, RF interference, what could you do the easiest Change the frequency of your wireless system. Localize and identify the source of interference and get rid of it. Another type of interference could be electrical interference and ambient noise. Electrical interference happens due to either electromagnetic induction or electromagnetic radiation emitted from an external source. The source may be any object that carries rapidly changing electrical charge, such as dimmer racks, LED walls, fluorescent lights, computers and so on. Even the sun or the northern lights can affect the quality of radio transmission. These effects can range from a simple degradation of data to a total loss of data. So avoid dimmer racks, separate wireless equipment always from digital equipment, especially within the same rack. Don't place any tablets or notebooks on top of the racks that hold the wireless equipment. What is ambient noise referred to? Um, imagine after many reflections, radio waves become weaker and essentially non-directional. They turn into general radio energy across a wide range of frequencies. This energy is then referred to as ambient radio noise or noise floor that is detected by your receiver as a continuous incoming low-level radio signal. Intermodulation between wireless components that are not just at harmonic frequencies of either, but also at the sum and difference frequencies and at multiples of those sum and difference frequencies of their original frequencies. So these signals are called intermodulation products and can interfere with your wireless channels. So to not run into intermodulation problems, use only frequencies from calculated frequency sets to prevent from third order intermodulation. And third party equipment should always be taken into account when setting up wireless equipment. So here we can see what happens if two frequencies are working together in one environment frequency 1, frequency 2, and together they generate additional frequencies 
which are our unwanted intermodulation products. And as you can see, they are quite strong already and taking a spot on the spectrum that we might need for another working channel. This happens already when two wireless microphones work together in close proximity. But look now what happens if we have three carrier frequencies in the same environment. They produce already quite a lot of additional intermodulation products and they eat even more of our usable spectrum. The only spot where we could place a fourth carrier frequency would be here marked with green color. So that is for your understanding what actually happens if two or more microphones work together and you might now be able to imagine what our spectrum would look like if we work 16 or even more channels at the same time. It's getting quite complicated then and um, that is why uh, it is very much suggested to only use calculated frequencies for your wireless channels. Let's see what we have here. Squelch function. Since the receiver cannot distinguish between the noise floor and the desired signal, it would also route the noise to the audio output where it annoyingly would be heard. To prevent from that, there is a circuitry built into the receiver called squelch. That works kind of like a noise gate. A threshold is set to a certain level where all the signals that are strong enough to lie above the threshold are passing through to the audio output. Ideally, all my desired signals are strong enough to pass and therefore will be heard. If signals come in that are weak enough to lie below the squelch threshold, they will be muted. Usually the noise floor is such a weak signal that will be muted anyway and therefore will not be heard at the audio output of the receiver. Ideally the squelch threshold should be set just above the noise floor level because the threshold also determines the dynamic range of a system. Assuming the squelch threshold is set to minus 100 dBm and your desired RF signal comes in at a level of minus 40 dBm, your system performs a dynamic range of 60 dB. That would be our dynamic range and that also would indicate our signal to noise ratio. The relation of incoming signal level and level of squelch threshold is referred to as signal to noise ratio, abbreviated as SNR. For those who are especially interested in figures, 0 dBm is referred to as decibel milliwatt. 0 dBm equals a rated power of 1 milliwatt. Let's say you set your squelch threshold to minus 70 dBm because you are facing an interfering frequency that comes in at minus 70 dBm and your incoming desired signal is still reaching a signal strength of minus 40 dBm. So you are reducing the dynamic range or your signal to noise ratio of your system to 30 dB, which would be fairly poor. So higher squelch threshold settings require a strong radio signal to open the squelch. And that is exactly the reason why you are limiting your working range with such a high threshold setting. Let's take the same example as before. Squelch threshold is still set to minus 70 dBm, but now your desired signal is getting weaker, maybe because your transmitter gets further away from the antenna. In this case, your signal falls below the threshold 
and immediately would be muted as well. No audio output signal will be heard as long as the desired signal gets stronger again, rising above the squelch threshold and therefore will be unmuted and audible again. So here we can clearly see higher squelch settings require higher received signals and higher received signal strengths to unmute the receiver and that fact is directly connected to your available working range. Since received signal strength decreases as transmission distance increases, high squelch settings will drastically reduce the working range of a wireless system. So be very careful with uh, squelch level adjustment and adjust the squelch level so that it is slightly above the RF noise floor. As we can here see we have a noise, noise level at about minus 95 dB and we set our squelch a little lower to minus 98. The noise will pass through and will be heard as audio noise on the receiver's output. That means Squelch is not muting your noise. If we now have again a noise floor of minus 95 dB and we now lower our threshold settings to minus 94, then the audio output will be muted and the noise won't be heard accidentally on your receiver's output. A further refinement in squelch functionality is the tone key. It enables the receiver to identify the desired radius signal by a tone that is generated in the transmitter and sent along with the normal radio signal. The receiver will unmute only when it picks up a radio signal with adequate strength and also detects the presence of the tone key. This function is also used to mask any turn-on, turn-off noise when uh, you are switching your uh, transmitter in an open audio channel on a mixing desk, for example. When the transmitter is switched on, the RF signal is activated immediately and the tone code is sent out slightly delayed, keeping the receiver muted until the RF link is stable. When the transmitter is switched off, the tone code is deactivated instantly, muting the receiver first while shutting down the transmitter is slightly delayed. And this way you prevent from any switching noise in the open audio channel. Ok folks, that's it for now. Next time more on Radio Signal Basics Chapter 4. Thank you for your interest, stay well, stay in tune, Reimer Fochler from AKG Acoustics.